Hello, I'm Penny Thornton and I'm talking astrology. On this video, I'm going to be talking about the full moon in Pisces on the 30th, 31st of August, depends where you are in the world. But also I'm going to be talking about Saturn, the power of Saturn in Pisces. Uh, and I'll explain all that as we go along. Now, the first thing I want to say before I get into any of this is that I know from the comments that you make, and thank you so much for your comments. They're wonderful comments, thank you. Uh, but I do notice that some of you get quite confused about the idea of when I'm talking about uh, Pisces or uh, Aries, you know, am I talking about Aries rising and Pisces rising, or am I speaking about the sun when I do my interpretations? Well, the answer to that is, it depends. Um, Basically, I'm talking or taking as a reference point the sun sign. So if you're an Aries, you're a sun Aries. If you're a Pisces, you're a sun Pisces. However, as we'll see when we come to this particular video, which is a full moon, so we've got two houses of the horoscope really uh, to talk about, then if you know where the moon in Pisces falls, whether it falls in your eighth house or the sixth house or whatever, then obviously listen to that interpretation as well as the one for your sun sign. Um, other thing before I get uh, moving and motoring is that a lot of you, and I understand this, I'm an impatient Aries myself, like to zoom straight to your sign so that you get the special, you know, five minutes or whatever it is that talks about your sign and what all the different configurations mean. On this occasion, the full moon and Saturn. Um, but really you miss quite a lot of information uh, that comes before that. So uh, take the time maybe to listen to what's called the overview because it fills in a lot of blanks and really gives you a much fuller picture of what astrology is all about. And as you know, this channel is about the spread of good astrology. So this full moon in Pisces, 30th or the 31st of August, depending where you are in the world. There's a sort of line that goes down the Irish Sea, if you like, uh, so that if you're born towards the West in America or in Hawaii, that far, then obviously it's going to be the 30th of August. And if you're born um, from the United, United Kingdom and on through to Australia, it's going to be the 31st. But whenever that full moon falls, it's or whatever time in your what time of day in your uh, nation is going to be taking place in Pisces. It's seven degrees Pisces and 26 minutes. And of course, we'll take a look at that in the context of what else is going on at the time in a minute. Now, this full moon is a blue moon. <laughs> yes, it's not going to look blue, but we call a blue moon uh, the second uh, full moon in a month, a calendar month. If you've got a uh, full moon as we did have at the 1st of August, and now we've got uh, a full moon on the 31st of August, that's two full moons in a month. The second one is called a blue moon. And it's a super moon, so it's going to loom really, really large. Uh, on the horizon. It's going to look absolutely beautiful, provided, you know, you haven't got a lot of clouds to cover it. And in fact, it's going to be the largest supermoon that we'll see until we get to November the 5th, 2025. So try to make a point of looking at that full moon on the 30th, 31st of August. And as always, on a full moon, it invites reflection and review. Now, this full moon also has a relationship with the new moon of, in Pisces on the 20th of February this year. They're like bookends, the new moon and the full moon. They complete a cycle. So the things that happened around that 20th of February period get to be completed around the time of this full moon or within the two weeks following that to new moon and the uh, waning cycle. 
So that's just a general kind of view. And you can think about that in your own life, what was happening in that February period. Are things coming to a conclusion now? Or are you ready to move something on to a new stage? It's going to be sort of different from, uh, you know, person to person. It's not an identical picture. But the six month cycle is always well worth uh, taking a look at. Now, the full moon is in Pisces, and that means for all of us, it's in Pisces, and it'll be in different areas of our horoscope. So we think about the sign of Pisces and what it represents. Um, it's a sign of mystery and imagination. Um, so we could say this full moon, the sun in Virgo, the moon in Pisces, is about, uh, in a way, bringing order Virgo out of chaos Pisces and I'm not meaning to insult the sign of Pisces I'm just looking at the idea that Pisces is everything everywhere all at once it's an all-consuming all-embracing sign whereas Virgo of course is quite particular and detailed so we're trying to bring these two aspects of life into balance and so it's bringing order out of chaos that's a nice neat little uh, uh kind of statement we can make to ourselves. But also we're looking at things to do with health of mind, body and spirit, and also things to do with our hopes and um, our dreams, really. And I'm going to be talking about that in a second in reference to Saturn. But one of the other things in line with uh, looking at the full moon and thinking about reflection and review this six month period between the new moon and the full moon, the reflect and review process is particularly powerful and important in regard to the ills that we have encountered in those six months. It's about reviewing them. It's about dissolving them in order to be able to move on. And that's, as I said, something in general that we can all take on board. Now, this full moon, as we'll see when we actually look at the full moon in its horoscope wheel, is very close to Saturn. So the sun is opposing Saturn, the moon is conjunct Saturn. So it brings Saturn in Pisces right into the forefront of uh, affairs. Now, I did an entire video on Saturn in Pisces, and I know a lot of you absolutely love that. It's a really, really good reference point to go back to if you haven't yet seen it or you'd like a bit of a refresher. But one of the things about Saturn in Pisces, and remember, I just talked about Pisces and the sense of everything, everywhere, all at once, and the idea of the opposition to Virgo, which is all about detail and organization, bringing order out of chaos. In a way, that Saturn's role as it moves through Pisces, it's bringing order out of chaos. Now, Pisces is a sign associated with uh, suffering and sacrifice. Yes, it's a sign noted for its compassion, for its sensitivity, for its ability to delve into all things mystical, to transcend uh, reality into a greater reality. That's all beautifully Pisces. But we put Saturn in that sign and getting, you know, there's, there's, there's a two ways of looking at it. Either you can bring uh, construction and you can create boundaries in terms of all those sorts of things to do with the mystical side of life, your uh, feelings, emotions, intuitions, imaginings. You can construct them, crystallize them. Good word for Saturn. But sometimes what Saturn does when it's in Pisces is the reverse. So instead of realizing our dreams, which is what you want Saturn in Pisces to do, to make a reality of those things that are, are kind of difficult to put into a, a, a cohesive form, sometimes you get the reverse and you get the idea of the shattering of one's dreams. Because of course, faced with reality, they can't exist. So we're playing around a lot with those themes, absolutely all of us, with Saturn in Pisces. Um, and of course, this full moon, which draws in to that uh, Saturn in Pisces experience, it's going to exacerbate 
those feelings. So we either get a moment when we feel very much that our dreams are realizable and we feel we're managing to make concrete something that previously was very difficult to put into any kind of package or form. On the other hand, it's going to represent the peak of our sense of not failure exactly, but how hard it is to follow our dreams and to believe in our dreams faced with the Saturnian reality. So those are the sorts of things we're playing with. And I think you'll all agree with me if you have friends and family or if you're like me, uh, you're a, an astrologer therapist, so to speak, and you're constantly working with people, you just know how many struggles people are having they're not all to do with the cost of living, they're to do with personal things, a lot of them to do with family things, so that people are experiencing quite a lot of pain or old pain within the family circle itself. And that is really one of the challenges that they're going through at this time, causing suffering, but ultimately through that wall of suffering comes something new and different. And in my conclusion, I'm going to be referring slightly to that. That's once we've gone through uh, this full moon according to sign by sign. But let's now take a look at how this full moon looks when we see it in the horoscopic circle. So here we have, uh, as you can see on the side, I like to set my 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 full moons, my new moons, my configurations, whatever it is I'm trying to show you, I like to set it from different uh, parts of the world. And in fact, my attention was to set this full moon in Pisces from Phoenix because I lived in Phoenix for uh, many years and I love Phoenix. And I thought I'd like to make a reference to this wonderful place in America. But actually what happened was I couldn't bring to light the configurations I wanted to talk about so clearly. So I ended up setting it from Washington. Now, what do I want you to see here? I want you to see in that uh, 12 o'clock position, the planet Pluto there at 28 degrees of Capricorn. It is exactly squaring the nodes, the omega sign that you can see on the horizon. And that's something I've been talking about on my uh, video about the change in the nodal axis. I spent a long time going through all that and I made a brief mention of why it's super powerful uh, when Pluto is connecting with that nodal axis so that any aspect that forms with the nodes or indeed any full moon, anything like that is going to be even more transformational because of its connection to Pluto. And we see this that quite clearly here, the nose squaring Pluto at this point. And in fact, right the way through to Christmas, really, Pluto will be part of the nodal story. So we are getting those words, transformation, reformation, which is the word I like so much. It's like we rearrange the furniture. And what happens when you rearrange the furniture? You move the sofa and what's that great big stain under the sofa? So we have to look at it and clear it up. And so Pluto's process is a little bit like that. We're reforming stuff and in the process making discoveries, some of them quite unpleasant. And so the eclipses which fall on the nodes or near the nodes are triggering that whole idea of what are we all going to find under the carpet. So the full moon in this particular wheel, we're seeing sort of in the 11 o'clock position, that's the moon in Pisces, up close and personal to Saturn. And right on the opposite side, we have the sun. And of course, that's what a full moon is. The sun is opposing the moon. Um, we can also look at uh, the position of Neptune. As you can see, if you look at Neptune in the um, 10 o'clock position, it's opposite Mars. It's not exactly opposite Mars, because by the time we reach the full moon on the 30th, 31st of August, Mars will already be in Libra. Mars will have opposed Neptune on the 22nd of August. So that's a pretty important time generally for all of us. But obviously, if you're a Pisces, a Virgo, 
uh, Sagittarius or Gemini and you've got a birthday around the 17th of your month, then that Mars-Neptune uh, opposition is going to really play into your life because it's going to do exactly what I said not so very long ago. It's playing around with that theme of dreams and hopes. So Mars is both encouraging and activating that process, but also bringing conflict into the mix as well. And that period of the month around the 22nd of August in general for the world is going to be a very kind of mysterious time. We're not going to know, you know, you know what, what's what. We, we don't know what to believe, who to believe, or what's really going on. There's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of fake news. There's a lot of conspiracy in the air. So it will be important for all of us, whatever our sun sign, whatever our chart, to really be able to separate uh, fact from fiction at that particular time. Now, on the 23rd of August, the sun enters the sign of Virgo. Now, it enters at uh, two minutes past nine UTC, GMT in old money. So babies born before that time will be Leos and babies born after two minutes past nine will be Virgos. And it's that different. You can't be both. <laughs> you're either a Leo or you're a Virgo. And it gets very confusing if you try to be both. I mean, yes, if you are born at that time, you are going to find Venus is in Leo, uh, but also Mercury is in Virgo. So one way or the other, you're getting a little bit of an introduction of both these signs uh, if you have a child born around that time. Mercury also turns retrograde on the 23rd and it will remain in retrograde until the 15th of September. So that's a roughly a three week period of stops and starts. I know a lot of people get very kind of stressed out about a retrograde Mercury. You know, if I'm going to sign something, that, that does that mean it's going to be null and void, that decisions are going to be reversed in the aftermath? Well, no, it doesn't always mean that. Obviously, it's better to sign documents and to agree to things when Mercury isn't retrograde. We've got to remember Mercury is retrograde for a reason if you have to sign something, and that reason will unfold as it should in the fullness of time. But don't get stressed out about it. Look at it as a quality. Mercury is Mercury whatever it's doing. It doesn't change its nature. As I often describe retrograde planets, you know, it, it, like a, a marinating a piece of chicken or a fish, the fish is still the same fish, the chicken is still the chicken. That you marinated it in spices, 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 <laughs> means that yes, the flavor is different, but it's still the same protein. And that's how you need to really look at retrograde mercuries. You're still going somewhere, but the past may play into the present a lot. Things may go a little bit more slowly. And there may be some reversals and U-turns along the way and the occasional pothole, but that's all part of the experience. Now, as I pointed out uh, a little earlier, the sun is opposing the moon because that's a full moon. Therefore, the moon conjunct Saturn means that the sun is opposing Saturn. The sun exactly opposes Saturn on the 27th of August. And that's its most intense connection to Saturn. And it's halfway through. Saturn entered Pisces six months ago. It's now, you know, we're, we're going backwards through the early parts, the early degrees of Pisces at the moment. But this is giving us a six month period when we're getting familiar with the idea of what this planet's role is in our lives while it journeys through Pisces. Now, in particular, if you are uh, a, a Pisces, then it's going to be the 25th and 26th of February birthdays that are going to get the biggest effect or the biggest Saturnian effect, whether that means things are going to be consolidated and set in stone, you know where you're going from here, or you get a bit of a disappointment and a setback, something now uh, appearing as a great obstacle in your path. Either way, ultimately, there's still a journey to be taken. It's not finished yet. And so 
you know, you don't always want to think of the difficulties that arise on a sun saturn opposition as being terminal or, uh, you know, never to be resolved. I personally feel Saturn. I can I can sense it, and I do kind of feel heavy. Um, I'm looking at a glass always half empty when there's a strong Saturn aspect, as there will be around the 27th of August. But usually, as it fades, I start to see situations in their correct light. And what I always try to do with Saturn is do something I don't want to do. I'm going to embrace its nature and its properties in order to make the astrology living in my life, so to speak. On the 29th of August, Uranus turns stationary retrograde. And we see Uranus in this uh, horoscopic circle round about the eight o'clock position. So sort of some days before that, even as you know, distant as the 15th of August and through to the second or first week of September, Uranus's power is particularly strong. And Uranus is about change. It's also about the new, the different. It's about uh, diversity in general, but it can also interrupt things so that where we thought we were going is not where we're going. And its purpose is always to awaken, whether it's to awaken us to a state of affairs that we need to be aware of, or whether we have just fallen asleep in our lives and need to have a bit of a wake up call. But yes, around that time, things may be very unstable, whether we're talking about, you know, things in your life, or whether we're talking about globally, nationally, internationally, it's a period of great instability. The last uh, date I'm going to mention here is the 4th of September, when we can see in the circle here, Venus, which is in about the five o'clock position at 12 degrees of Leo at the time of the full moon, it's retrograde in this horoscope wheel because it will be retrograde until the 4th of September. So on the 4th of September, Venus turns direct. It's going to start moving forward and if that Venus has played a part in your chart, in your natal chart, if Venus in Leo is particularly important, it's connected with planets and points in your own chart, maybe there are events that go with this that mean something has been backtracking, not moving very far. It's, it's sort of been out of kilter, not really functioning, especially things to do with the heart, the affairs of the heart, things to do with money, Things to do with those aspects of life that give us joy and pleasure. There's been a little bit of a backtracking about it all. And maybe things haven't felt as though they've been the same or what they should be. So as soon as Venus turns direct over the next couple of weeks, you should find things beginning to right themselves. Although by the same token, what also happens is that if something has got to be dealt with, done and dusted, then you're going to see that as well. And yes, maybe that is to do with a relationship or something else that's close to your heart. On the same day, the 4th of September, Jupiter turns retrograde. So it's one planet turns direct, the other turns retrograde. And Jupiter will be in retrograde for oh, about 11 weeks, maybe a little bit longer. And again, that doesn't mean that Jupiter's power is any less. It's still a very powerful uh, principle. Um, it's about abundance, it's about growth, but of course it's also about inflation and things getting out of control, excess, if you like. So we have to think about those two a very different extremes when we think about Jupiter's function in our lives at the moment. And you can come back to me now and I'll talk a little bit more about this again. I don't want to go over old ground with uh, the reason Jupiter is uh, both expansion and growth and all the good things that we love about Jupiter. And it's also things to do with things getting out of hand in its retrograde form. It isn't any the less Jupiter. 
just a little bit different. And I think sometimes going back over the opportunities that have arisen while Jupiter has been going forward, it gives us a chance to rework things as all retrograde planets do. It's an opportunity to rework, not an opportunity to give up the ghost and say, oh, this will never work. It's about reworking, reviewing and reflecting. So, um, Yes, there was one other thing that um, I wanted to mention in regard to Saturn in Pisces, and this is just a general thing, and I don't think I did mention it on my big Saturn in Pisces video, but I've thought about it since because I like to talk about things that we can all take away with us, and they aren't so complicated. We've no idea how to make it relevant to our lives and to us. And the idea of Saturn in Pisces is really that Saturn represents the shadow. And so why all of us to a certain extent are having such troubles with things in life we don't like very much, we feel very uncomfortable with, we wish we didn't have anything to do with them. And we are also feeling as though we didn't have anything to do with what's happening. Well, that's because Saturn in Pisces works like the shadow in our lives, the Jungian shadow, that which we don't want to recognize in ourselves. We see it in others, we see it out there, we don't like it very much, we don't want it, we want to shun it, put it out of our lives, but actually it is part of us. It has something to do with us. And while Saturn is in Pisces, all of us, are getting that opportunity to realize that a lot of the things that are painful to us belong to our shadow. And that's what Saturn in Pisces is revealing. So that's a really important thing that uh, I wanted to cover. But yes, let's start going through sign by sign, as, as I said a little bit earlier, um, that I like to work from the sun sign because you know, that's what sun sign astrology is all about, it's about your sun sign. Um, but of course, I know, for instance, we're going to be talking about the houses that this full moon is flanking. And if you know exactly where this full moon is, what houses of your natal chart it's falling in, then go there too. Uh, take a reference point from there. So let's start with Virgo. Uh, the sun is in Virgo. And uh, as we approach the full moon and the full moon itself in Pisces, we're looking at the opposition straddling the first and seventh houses. Now, this is also the relationship axis. And what do we do at full moons? We close and complete so the idea around the time of this full moon, Virgo, and also through the following two weeks, the waning cycle, is that you close and complete something to do with a relationship or with something that involves people, an endeavor that has relationships within it. It's closed and complete. Now, that may mean, of course, that you are going to uh, join forces with uh, with somebody, whether that's for business or whether it's for romance. Maybe you've decided to get engaged or move in with your significant other. And so that full moon is sort of a done deal. That's what you're doing. But it can also be separation, can't it? When we look at polarities, we look at one thing opposing the other. The seeds of unity are within both, but they're separate. And sometimes we go our separate ways when uh, we have the, uh, the full moon on this particular axis. It's time, a relationship has done its time. It's time to end it. But of course, Virgo, for you, the sun is in your sign and it's going to remain in your sign right through until about the 21st of September. So the sun gives you that solar power. Uh, it puts you in the driver's seat. And I think it's important for you to remember that because sometimes, Virgo, you're very reticent and you sort of want to see what, what other people are doing before you decide what you're going to do. But the power is with you, Virgo. So during the time the sun is in your sign, you want as much as possible to recognize you're in the driver's seat. And that means you're going to set in motion certain things, especially to do with your personal life and your personal ambitions, but also to recognize you have power. And 
even in situations where you feel you're being undermined by someone or you feel other people have got you know more power than you no they haven't when the sun is in your sign the sun is illuminating your sign or the sun is in your first house even um, then of course you are all powerful your ego is strong and i mean that in a good way your brand is to the fore so in many ways, this full moon for you, Virgo, is a time of completion, but it may also be a bit of a stressful time when you feel that things are pulled apart, shall we say. But of course, that means it's time to see how things can be brought back in balance and brought back together. So if we move on to Libra, the sun at the moment is working its way through the 12th house. And you may know that I call this 12th house the house of secrets of shadows, because everything is just a little bit foggy. Nothing is terribly clear. You yourself may not feel 100%, whether you've got an old injury that's playing up, or whether you're just not feeling great, or whether you're a bit distracted, you're not sort of feeling as though you've got control of the ball. You know, other people have control of the ball, not you. And where do you fit into certain situations? What's going on? Are you left out of the loop? You know, what is it? Now, of course, when the sun is moving through the 12th house, it is a period of renewal in a way. And the idea really is, is to clear up loose ends and to get organized in a way, but it's also a time for rest and retreat. Now, I realize that's utterly impossible. Maybe in the good old days, it was possible to say, right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take a week off and I'm gonna shut myself away from the rest of the world and come back to myself. Not these days, we've all got such busy lives, lots of demands on our time. And so what we really need to be thinking about is a few early nights, paying attention to our health and fitness, not trying to push ourselves when we're exhausted, to learn about how to balance our bodies, how to balance our mind, and of course, how to balance our spiritual needs with the needs of the real world. So when we look at this full moon for you, uh, Libra, we're looking at a moment when health matters are to the fore. Again, whether that means it's your annual checkup time, dental work, you know, whatever it is, you're aware of the health of the body, health of the mind and spirit as well, of course, I've just mentioned. But sometimes on a full moon, there's um, a, a kind of things come to a tipping point. So if you've been worried about an aspect of your well-being, it's likely to feel worse at the full moon. But of course, there's a reason for that, because it's only when we feel things are at their worst that we think, oh, I've got to do something about this. So this full moon is, in a way, a call to arms, Libra. If there's something that's bothering you, if there's something that's sort of not really taking shape, something that you feel is undermining you, then it's really, really important to figure things out as to why you feel that way. And of course, once you've figured out your feelings, you can start to feel your way to some kind of resolution. But remember, at the time of this full moon, you're going to feel a little bit less able to um, be your usual balanced self. Things are going to feel a little bit out of whack. Um, but it will come back to uh, normal, perhaps in the following few days. And also I talked about Saturn representing the shadow. And so things that are happening around the full moon time, wow, they may not be your fault. It's always worth thinking about, is this something about me that's in this situation that I need to address. So that's also a very important role this full moon is going to uh, play in your particular life. So now we come to Scorpio and for you at the moment, the sun is working its way through the 11th house. So this is a very collaborative kind of area of the horoscope. It's where we work with other people. We come together with other people for joy, for celebrations, for good times or for a think tank. 
It's also an area of enterprise. So during this time, we can come up with ideas that we may want to get behind. And it's also a time when we may be just a little bit more aware of our fellow humans. Um, and this is a very kind of altruistic area of the horoscope. So if you suddenly feel you really want to belong to an organization that helps other people, or you want to do something yourself that is uh, for the benefit of your human uh, relations, then this is a good thing to do. The 11th house, Aquarius is territory. We really want to get into our spirit of community. We want to learn the benefits about uh, being together as a team, as opposed to doing things of a solo nature. Now we come to that full moon, and instead what we have now is the polarity going, and so we're going to feel the tensions that are in collaborations, especially since the moon is conjunct Saturn, sun is opposition Saturn, we're going to be seeing the things that are blocking the way to fulfillment. So we're going to think this will never work out. This project, this endeavor, it's got too many problems to you know, be realizable. Well, maybe, maybe that is true, or maybe it's not. Maybe what you're looking at at this time and feeling at this time is that you can't go on or that it's not working or that something is the way it is and you don't like it, that it's there for you to look at. And instead of abandoning necessarily, of reworking it, reviewing it, and reflecting on it. Remember those three R's that I used a little bit earlier on. Everything that comes to a tipping point is there for us to, at that juncture, make a, make a decision, but one that's an informed decision, not something that's done as a knee-jerk action. Remember one of the things about a polarity like this, and we're looking at the sun moving through the 11th house, so it's all about higher, the higher path, it's all about the group, the community, the bigger world, it's not about the small world of ourselves, when we get a full moon here, it's like the small world of ourselves is feeling really a bit stressed out, what does it mean that we're facing these oppositions and obstacles, this is affecting me personally, but remember the way to resolve it is to think of yourself as part of something and not as the only thing in it, and I hope that really gives you some good advice around the time of this full moon. If we come to Sagittarius, the sun is currently moving through the 10th house and it will continue to highlight the 10th house right through until the 20th of, uh, of September. So it's all about goals. It's about where am I going in life? You know, what do I want to achieve? What's happening to the world that I've created, the world I'm living in, the world where everybody can see me, the material world? So it's different for different Sagittarians, but this is a period generally when you need to be meeting uh, people who can help your cause in some way, whether that means superiors in the working area of life, whether it means authority figures, government figures, people who can help you with your material concerns, but who can also help you make progress. And it could be a time when you're very much out there you're not in your private self and in your private life. You're right out there in front of everybody, a very public period for you. So along comes this full moon. And what do we get? We get conflict. How much of your time is, spell, is spent building your world and being out there as opposed to being in the sanctuary of home and family? It's going to highlight differences, problems, situations within your family life and your home life and the things that are really pertinent to your really, really personal self it versus what the world expects of you, the things that you need in order to survive and live and put a roof over your head. The balance has to be found here. And when we think of those words that go with a full moon, closure and completion, maybe it's time for something to end. Is it the time for a job to end? Is it the time for a, 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 your stay in a certain place? Is it coming to an end? 
Uh, is there something within the family that represents the end of a chapter? All these things could be relevant around the time of the full moon and indeed in the following two weeks, which takes us up to the new moon uh, in the sign of, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember, this. the next new moon is, is going to be in Virgo. Um, but the important thing is you've got a, a two week period in which the issues I'm talking about between place in the world, your career, you out there, versus private you, your home, your family, the things that are closest to you, there's tension here. And that tension needs to be resolved in some way. So here we go on to Capricorn. And the sun at this time of year is moving through the ninth house of far horizons. Do I love this area of the chart? Yes, I do. I love it when the sun goes through my ninth house because it means all things to do with the world out there. Uh, different countries, people in different countries, the international scene, travel, uh, knowledge, education, different cultures, all sorts of things start to have life. And it, maybe you won't do all of those things, but if you're listening to me right now and thinking, oh, I suddenly got a yen to travel and I booked, you know, travel plans for next year, but I'm doing it right now, or maybe you are off on your travels or will be during this time of the full moon. But it's also about journeys of the mind, journeys in knowledge, journeys in experience. So this is really at a very important time for sort of doing things in your life that go towards your long-term future, far horizons in this case, meaning the far horizons of your life. So the things that tend to happen at this time are formative, and if you like to think about where you'll be five years, 10 years down the line, this full moon and also the time that the sun is moving through the ninth house, it's an important time to think, am I on the right trajectory for what I want or where I want to be years down the line? And so this full moon offers you an opportunity to say, you know what, I've got to end some things right now because I'm way off target. And these are the things that are keeping me away from my future or the future I want to have in front of me. So that full moon is such an important time to make that decision. I don't need this in my life anymore. I don't need this activity, this pursuit. This is not serving my ultimate purpose. Now, of course, that full moon may represent the end of a journey anyway, uh, maybe, bang on target. And sometimes on the full moon, we do experience travel problems, whether it's just us not feeling too good about travel or whether there are problems, you know, with our point of embarkation or the journey to it, there is more stressful. People are more stressed out. So travel could be a little bit problematic around about the 30th, 31st of August. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But I think also we need to look at this idea of sort of coming to the end of something that's done its time. And maybe it's a course, maybe it's a, maybe you've got an exam and the results have come in. And so that's done, you know, done the exam, you've got the results and hey, now you're out there. Where do you go from here? So it's both a nice full moon in some ways because of what it, it means in terms of your long-term future. And a lot of things can be sorted out in the wake of this full moon, as opposed to necessarily on the day itself. And that's going to be good for you um, as you, you know, go through um, the, the next few weeks, months, if not years. So if we come now to Aquarius, we're going to be looking at this full moon across the second eighth axis, as we say in the business. The sun is currently moving through the eighth house and the moon will be in the second house. And this is an axis that has a lot to do with survival. It has a lot to do with uh, money. I mean, like it or not, without money, we can't put a roof over our heads and that's survival. 
um, without uh, having relations with people, whether they're financial relations or uh, sexual relations, then uh, you know we are we aren't going to do terribly well all on our own. So this full moon is all about sharing. It's about receivership. It's about how we receive things, how other people play into financial matters and matters that we consider central to our survival. That's what we're looking at with this full moon. So let's talk a little bit about the sun simply in the eighth house, as it will be right through to the 20th, 21st of September. It's a very, very good time to get things sorted with financial institutions, with banks, with uh, mortgage uh, lenders, with credit card companies, with your partners, business partners, or with your life partner. You wanna set finances on a better course. You've gotta have dialogue, you've gotta have debate, you've gotta have new agreements. And so this full moon can actually work very well across this axis because it allows you to come to an agreement so that things can be settled between you. Is that a settlement coming out of a marriage, for instance, or out of a business? Is it an inheritance? Is it something coming to you that is now done and dusted? That sort of receivership. Or is it receivership in another way? And that with finances out of control, maybe that is the right route for you. So. A lot of things to consider around the time of this full moon. And one of the things I note about the eighth house, it's a kind of mysterious house. And I know a lot of students have a lot of trouble with it when they're just learning astrology. What is this a house of sex and death? I don't get it. <laughs> well, of course, it's much more than that. And it is about the exchanges we make with people that are central to our survival, emotional survival, and also our financial survival. And it's the relationships we have with others and the agreements we can come to, the strengths and the weaknesses of the relationships we have that play into our sense of stability and security in the world. So uh, now we move on to Pisces. And of course, this full moon is in your sign, up close and personal to Saturn, which of course I've talked about in general, in the overview. Um, going back to the new moon in Pisces on the 20th of February, this is really pertinent to you to have the new moon then and the full moon now, because it does wrap things up. They are bookends, one way of looking at it. And so consciously to think of, what can I close off now? What is really done at this time, especially to do with my personal situations? It's a good time to say, OK, I'm done with that. It's over. It's completed. I've now got to free up space and time and energy for other things. Um, the sun, of course, is moving through the seventh house of relationships at this time. So in the same way as Virgo, sun in Virgo, we're talking about the relationship axis for Virgo and Pisces. So this whole idea of you in terms of your relationship with other people is really what this full moon is all about. But for you, Pisces, with the sun moving through the seventh house, it is a period when other people's needs and feelings need to be addressed. So although you're very important, and of course this full moon, moon in Pisces gives you empowerment at that point. But in general, while the sun is moving through Virgo, it's other people have control of the ball. That's not a bad thing. Everything is swings and roundabouts. Eventually it comes around to you later on. It's your time to get to know what other people want, who they are, how they feel. And it is a good time to form new relationships or to strengthen old relationships. And that full moon is very much one that we could look at in terms of signatures on contracts. And so this may be a time to sign on the dotted line, to uh, commit yourself to uh, a company or an individual, whether we're talking about romance and marriage, or whether we're talking about something a little bit more business oriented. It's a, that full moon is good for that. 
But of course, what it will also do, especially since the moon in your sign is conjunct Saturn, is show you where things are done. You know, this is no way forward. Saturn is saying there are limits to this. There are boundaries and you've reached the boundary. And maybe that's all there is. Maybe it isn't, but maybe it is. If you think back to the idea of Saturn itself, it was at one time considered to be the end of the solar system. That was it. There was nothing beyond Saturn. That was the end of everything. But then, of course, Uranus popped up. And we learned there was a whole new world out there. And so in a way, although I'm saying it's a time of endings for you, Pisces, it could be an ending before there's a new level of that situation about to take off. But nonetheless, it is a good time to end something. And it is a good time to recognize that sense of completion to do with a project or association or whatever else it may be. Aries, right now the sun is moving through the sixth house, that area where so much of our life is organized. I know that sounds, I'm actually quite an organized person myself. I like organization. It it gives me a sense that things are, are in control. So that sixth house is about Um, knowing that the routine round, knowing that the structures and systems in our life are functioning well, because if they're all functioning, our life runs smoothly. We can take off, we can do whatever we want, because we know everything is running as it should do. So on the one hand, with the sun moving through this area, it's the time to really look at the how your life runs and what can be done to get it to run better. It's about your work and how you work. Um, So this may mean there are changes going on in the workplace or there are things that are focused on the workplace that are both uh, shedding light into it and giving energy to it, uh, but also um, suggesting that, you know, things have to be worked at. There's work and things that have to be worked at. So the sun in its passage through the sixth house may sound as though it's a little routine, dull, pedestrian. No, it's not. It's so fundamental to the success of our lives and getting the details right, getting the structures right. In a funny kind of way, it enables us to find our purpose, which is what the sixth house holds out to us. So this full moon, could on one level sort of say, you know, this is a situation has reached a point where it's either showing you that this is the way to go, this is what you're meant to be doing, or it's going to do the reverse and show you quite clearly, I shouldn't be here. This is not what I'm meant to do. This is not where I'm meant to be. You're seeing either either ends of that. It's also about health. The sixth house has a lot to do with systems the systems our life runs run by, which includes our health system. So as the sun moves through the sixth house, we should be thinking about the health of our mind, body and spirit. It's a good time to take an overall look at how fit we feel and how much fitter we may like to feel. It's a good time to make appointments for checkups, dental checkups, things like that. And the point of this full moon is that it might show you where work is to be done. And just literally use those words to remind yourself what this full moon is about. It's showing you where work needs to be done. So that if you have got an old injury or you've got some other health issue and you've been sort of letting it go and just, oh, it'll get better in its own time. It's probably going to feel worse around the time of this full moon. Things that are weaknesses in the system are going to be seen for what they are with the purpose of changing it, of addressing it, of sorting it. So top of the list for you, Aries, really is this idea of health, of mind, body, and spirit, and also all systems go in terms of how your life runs. So in fact, regardless of how the sixth house is often thought of the Cinderella of all the houses, far from it, quite the reverse. It's the most purposeful house in a way of the whole of the 12th. 
So let's move on now and we move to Taurus. And at this time of year, the sun moves through the fifth house. And that's our house of joy. <laughs> this is our inner child. This is where we play. And so it can be quite a sporty area. Uh, it brings out our desire to be competitive. It brings out our uh, desire for joy. Um, it brings out our creative spirit and also our procreative spirit. So things to do with pregnancy, childbirth, and our children often feature when we've got a fifth house transit. And it is a good time to think about such things. And uh, again, coming back to the idea of the fifth house being the inner child, um, it's such an important part of our lives. Of course, as we grow up, we become adults and we take on adult trappings. Um, but we forget that when we were little, um, play was an important part of life because it allowed us to extemporize and to try things and to see how it would work, but all in the sense of play. Or well, we don't do that as we get to be adults because everything is so serious by the time we become adults. But really finding solutions to things, finding happiness, finding joy is really in play. The things that we enjoy and feel like play, that's going to be an important purpose, if you like, during the time the sun is in Virgo. And it may also coincide with the fact that you're taking a holiday you're spending time with the kids, you're doing a lot of stuff with the kids, or you're thinking very hard about becoming a parent or having another child. These are all fifth house matters. So the full moon, moon in the 11th house, sun in the fifth house, is both about fulfillment. It's the end of a gestation period. That really is one way to look at this. And what is a gestation period? Well, the one we know mostly is about the time it takes for a baby to develop from uh, a fetus into a, a, a baby at nine months. So there is not only the six month cycle to take into consideration the time from the new moon on the 20th of February to the full moon on the 31st of August, 30th of August, but there's also the nine month factor as well, and even a three month factor, which you may find relevant at the moment. So that things that were either three months, six months, nine months past come into the present in some way, hopefully as a sense of completion done and dusted, but it can also be the start of another stage. But if we think about gestation periods in general, Let's talk about things that we make plans for. We have little sketchy plans. We'd like to do this. We'd like to go there. What do we need? And we sort of have a period where we're trying to put it all together. And suddenly we've got our plan. It's formulated. We're ready for the off. And that's what this full moon is about. A lot of things have been in preparation. And you know what? This full moon and during the waning period, it's ready for the off. And that's a really good and positive thing to have in mind about this full moon, even though it may be conjunct Saturn and it shows you there's some hard labor involved, it's all to good purpose. So now we come to Gemini and for Gemini, the sun is currently moving through the fourth house of your solar chart or it's the base of life. So things to do with the family, with the home, with the roots of life, um, are important at the moment. And this may be because you're doing lots of things with the family, or you've got a member of the family who is rather important at the moment, whether they've got something special happening to them, or you're a little bit concerned about them. Uh, and often there are concerns that happen when we've got the fourth house brought out in our uh, horoscopes. It isn't always for fun and games. It can also be because things need to be done. Things need to be attended to. And when we think of this full moon on that axis, the sun in the area of home, uh, the moon in the area of uh, the world out there, career, life direction, all of that, we're also looking at perhaps the stresses and strains between keeping those two aspects of your life in balance. I mean, 
it, there needs to be balance in life. We need a good work-life balance. And I think this full moon really shows you where it's unbalanced or imbalanced and it needs to be righted. You know, either not at home enough and not in your own, the sanctuary of yourself, so to speak. You're just out there socializing, being, doing, and that's not good. You, you need to come back to your inner sanctum. Um, but neither is it good the opposite way in that you're spending so much time in yourself, in your inner sanctum, that you're not getting out. You're not actually sharing anything or being seen out in the world. So this full moon is about that balance and it reminds you which end of that are you perhaps out of whack with? What's too great and not enough, right? We've got that balance there. The other thing I think that this does, aside from suggesting that Maybe you've got a house move coming up, a home move. You've got to move from where you're living, which can happen on this particular full moon. It's also about ending something. Does that mean ending a feud? Has there been a family feud? Or has there been some kind of issue that's unresolved and it's causing everyone within the family a kind of head-banging situation? You know, why can't we sort this? This full moon is about sorting it. And since I'm talking to you and you're the one that knows about this full moon, it might be down to you to get the family, knock their heads together and say, you know what, this is what we need to do now. We're going to sit in this room until we've done it. And I think that might really help uh, some of you Geminis who are really struggling with certain situations related to the family. Oh, actually, even with a property, both those things are applied. So here we come to Cancer, and the sun moves through the third house of your horoscope in between the 21st of August and the 21st of September. So this is all about outlook. It's a, you know, I love reducing things to one word. Uh, I mean, if, if you can do that, simplify things that much, it, it's good. So <laughs> The transit of the uh, the sun in your third house is about outlook. It's how you look out on the world. It's what your outlook is on life in general. It's about changing your outlook if that will help you be more successful or to resolve some of the problems you have. It's a change of outlook. It's a change of mindset. I do go on about this, I know. <laughs> I talk about it to my clients, I talk about it when I write, but it's because I know it to be so true and you're getting the benefit of all these decades of experience I've had, that if you change your mindset about something, you change the outcome. And that's so important. So we all get stuck in grooves, don't we? I'm in this groove and I'm not going to get out of it. I've always thought this way. It's always worked this way. This is the way things are. But hey, is that why you keep running into brick walls all the time or running into the same problem? Maybe what would help is walking a mile in someone else's shoes or looking at a situation from a totally different perspective. And once you see it in a different light, my goodness, you can change things. So the sun's journey through the third house may mean that you're doing a lot of communication, lots of little journeys back and to forever. And given that Mercury will be going retrograde on the 23rd of August, it may mean that there are some frustrating journeys, a frustrating journey in terms of travel, frustrating journeys in terms of getting where you need to go with people and situations. But hey, it's a journey. You just have to keep on going until you get there and also keep on revising and reviewing things in order to get there better. And again, this is what that full moon is about because it says it's the end of a journey. Something is completed. It's done. So it will either give you a satisfactory conclusion to an endeavor or to something that's been going on, or what will happen at that full moon is that you realize how out of whack things are and what really must be done in order to put things right. There can be legal agreements attached to a, a full moon across the third and ninth axis, or it can also be things to do with education and academia, you can get qualifications, you can get 
signed up to something after you've done an exam or you've done qualifying rounds. And, and so there is that aspect to this full moon on the third ninth axis. Saturn is in there as well. So it shows there is some struggle around, but struggle isn't a bad thing, Cancer. Often things that are really hard to get turn out to be really worth all the trouble. And if you are having a hard time around this full moon and you do feel the results are disappointing, or you're not really getting where you want to get, just keep on keeping on, okay? All right, Cassie. Uh, now let's move on to Leo, which is our last sign. And for you, the uh, sun at the moment is moving through the second house. The moon will be in the eighth house. So the axis we're looking at is the second house and the eighth house. A lot to do with money, your security, and your stability. Now, with the sun moving through the second house, it's really an opportunity for you to build. For you to build your self-esteem, for you to build things that will serve you well in the future. It's a good time to grow your income. It's a good time to look for ways to increase your income. If you are having uh, salary talks with uh, an employer, for instance, set, your, set yourself up, you know, upgrade yourself, feel full of self-esteem because this is the opportunity to increase your self-worth on all levels, both how people value you as a person and what you do, but also the value, you know, in terms of your assets, you know, what assets you have in life and how your income supports you and your life. So the second house is all about that. It's about money, self-worth, evaluation, all of that stuff. So we have a full moon and we get different kind of alternatives. We talk about closure and completion with a full moon. So here we can get the completion of a contract. And in England, when you purchase a house, once it's really yours, you close and complete. That's what it's called, close and complete. That's the final contract. But it's the same here where we spread it out to other things, that everything has been done, all sorts of things have been agreed or not agreed, you know, whatever it is. So finally, it's done. We're done. We're ready to agree to this. It's a good time to sort new financial agreements, to get them ratified. It's a good time to get finances in balance and get new terms and new agreements in place so that you can prosper and thrive. But that full moon works in two ways. It will either, as I've just described, set things nicely into an agreement so you know where you are going forward. It's good. It's done. It's dusted. It's settled. But on the other hand, it may, you know, finances may reach a tipping point where you realize I can't go on this way. Something's got to give. And that serves a purpose because after the crisis come talks and getting things in a position where you will be able to manage them. So a crisis of any sort, <clears throat> excuse me, serves a purpose in that not only does it mean you are forced to confront it and deal with that crisis, but thereafter, you know, you're off and running, it's done. You're now on a, a new course. And of course, we see that uh, symbolized by the new moon and full moon cycle in that what follows a full moon, what follows closure and completion, but a new moon and a new beginning. So there we go. There are um, all my 12 signs done and dusted. And I hope that this time around, you really kind of got where your full moon, uh, you know, where it is. And it, it's making a lot more sense to you than had I not gone through all the kind of indications, all that directing. <laughs> OK, and so we're at my conclusion, the things that I've been thinking about and what I've really been thinking about over the past few weeks, actually, because in fact, I haven't done a video for a little while. And what was uppermost in my thoughts were really family patterns. Remember, I talked a bit about 
Saturn in Pisces and how it's the shadow. Uh, Saturn is revealing aspects of the shadow, our shadow. So it seems that events coming into being have nothing to do with us. We haven't caused them. We've had nothing to do with them, but we don't like them. We don't like what's happening and they make us feel powerless and we wish they'd go away. Well, in some regard, the shadow is also the shadow of the past. We inherit patterns. That's one thing you see as an astrologer. If you do family charts, you see how patterns repeat themselves in families. And of course, I've talked quite a lot about the fourth house and our ancestral voices. But this idea that we have patterns of behavior and patterns of behavior are both learned and acquired as we grow up, but they're also inherited. We inherit family patterns. And this came to light to me this, this week very strongly because uh, I found myself uh, addressing a situation which I didn't like very much. You know, I thought, oh, I don't like this. It's not nothing to do with me. Why did this happen? And I found myself talking about it like my mother <laughs> and saying things like my mother. And my mother was a double Scorpio, Sun Scorpio, Scorpio rising. And she was a, a tad paranoid and she tended to see the worst in people, not the best. So what happened was her pattern of existence was to always have a, a kind of shrinking life so that things never really took her beyond, you know, where she could have gone, where she could have moved to. Always the fear of what people would say or that what people thought about her, but also focusing really on what the negatives were in something and that kind of fear holding her back. And this was my observation as her daughter. But I found myself in exactly the same position. I could have been my mother. <laughs> so this light bulb of awareness went on and I thought, OK, I have to change this instead of going on with this situation and sort of making it worse in a way, um, proving my point, you know, whatever it was, I thought, you know what, I'm going to love bomb it. I'm going to absolutely love bomb that situation. And not only did that make me feel a lot better and, uh, you know, just it bred a lot of positive energy, it made a huge difference to the situation. And it, it, it's interesting in life. Often we change, we, we have a, a, a switch, of, a flipper switch, so that our reactions change and our behavior changes. And then magically, it seems as though the situation suddenly changes. But there's a kind of resonance between these two things. Is it, does the situation change and therefore you change or do you change and the situation changes? I know there are two ways to look at it. But I firmly believe in this idea that the patterns that we've inherited, the patterns that we've grown ourselves from scratch through our experience, the important thing is that recognition, that awakening when we think, you know what, I, mm, I, I know this, I've been here before, or I've seen this before in my parents, my grandparents, my children even. And that's a pattern. And once we see there's a pattern, we can either use it to our advantage, if it's a good pattern, and we can see that the way things have worked out and the way we're in that pattern is something that's positive and growth oriented, we can continue to use that pattern. But if we can see that pattern is holding us back, is causing us grief, is causing other people grief and hindering our process through life, we need to break that pattern. We need to step out of it. And of course, by doing that, we break the family pattern so that generation after generation isn't stuck going around the same kind of circular path. We, if we can break a pattern, we break a pattern for the whole of the family. And in light of so many things that I'm hearing at the moment, so many of you having problems with family, the idea is if you can break your own pattern, you're helping break the psychic threads 
so to speak, that keep that problem or that issue or that problem alive. You break it like a spider's web, it breaks. So there's always something that we can do that we haven't done. And maybe that also, thinking about it, we need to think about the shadow that we have. We've all got a shadow. We need to look at that shadow honestly so that it isn't such a problem for us. I mean, cropping up as it does in other people and other situations, it's our shadow. Embrace it, look at it, break that pattern. So thank you all for watching. Thank you all for your support, for your subscriptions, for everything. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time when I'm going to be doing a very, very meaty video. Bye for now.